This is Connect with Skip Hightech, and welcome to our first program of the new year. This is Scott Dooley, your host today, as we present an important teaching from the life of Abraham. So, how was your life before the pandemic? Did your family have a full calendar? Many have discovered that perhaps we were moving too fast before life suddenly came to an unexpected and unwelcome halt. The pandemic has forced us all to consider our priorities. In today's message, Skip Heitzig draws our attention to the life of Abraham to demonstrate how you can have a powerful testimony by simply walking with God by faith day after day. Let's open our Bibles to the 11th chapter of Hebrews as we join Skip for this message. So you might live there for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 60 years, but the only permanent plot of land you'll really ever reside in for a long period of time is a six foot hole in the ground. So it behooves us to have a light touch, right? To live as pilgrims, a like Abram. Now God called him, God made promises to him. Uh, those promises weren't completely fulfilled, many of them were, but certainly not the land promise to Abraham in his lifetime but the promise is that he would become a nation. Now, most people read this and they think automatically, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm never going to become a nation. Abraham did become a nation, but I'll never become a nation. What is a nation? A nation is simply the expansion of one person. A person gets married, a person becomes a family unit, the family unit grows, and so a nation is simply the expanse of one person. Ray Stedman put it this way, in the Bible every nation begins with a man, and then there is a family, and as the family grows and expands, there is finally a nation. Every nation is but the continued expanded life of a single man. So here's the fact check for your faith. Even the little things you do in life can have great influence. The little steps of faith you take ex that, that expand your influence in people's life make a huge difference. Okay, faith fact number three. He lived by his patience. What do I mean by this? Well, God made him a promise, but years went by. Now, he's already old when God made him a promise. He's 75 when God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. That he's 75. He won't have a kid. Uh, well, he'll have Ishmael. I'll get to that. But he won't have his son Isaac till he's 100 years old. Well, this requires patience because I don't know what, how long you've been waiting for what you think are God's promises to you, but 25 years he waited. Now, in verse 11, we meet his better half, uh -huh. I guess that could be debated. We meet Mrs. Abraham. We meet Sarah, verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, <laughs> were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Abraham and Sarah had, a, I suppose, a normal life, maybe a three-bedroom tent, a two-camel garage, right? They had each other, but they had no child. And uh, even though God said, I'm going to make a nation out of you, I'm going to bless you, and you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, great. But time passed, and he's not getting any younger. In fact, he's getting quite a bit older. And one night, um, God says to him, uh, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And this is wonderful, but, but you can just almost feel... Abram's resistance because he's been patient and waiting so long. He says, what will you give me seeing that I am childless? And I have this guy named Eliezer who's my heir, this dude from Damascus, but he's not like mine. What are you going to give me? So 
When he says that, God says, Abe, step outside. Let's do some stargazing together. Check, check those stars out. Can you count them? I'm going to make your offspring more in number than the stars that you can count in the sky. And it says, after God told him that, another promise, it says Abraham believed God. And he, God accounted it to him as righteousness. Just going, okay, I believe it. Amen. Sure, whatever. You know, he just made a statement of faith, and God said, okay, that's enough for me to account you as righteous. Now, in that conversation, Abraham is now 86 years old. From 75, 11 years pass, and he says, look at the stars. I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of heaven. So it has been 11 years since Abe gets the first promise that his wife Sarah is going to have a child. <laughs> so, you know, month after month, year after year, after year after year, same question. Are you pregnant yet? Nope, I can't get pregnant. And I'm a really old person, so I, the odds are not in my favor. Now, you know that Abram is a name that means exalted father. That's what his name means, exalted father, which is an embarrassing name for a guy who can't have a kid. So the caravans come by and they go, hey, what, how are you doing? He goes, great. And the caravan leader says, what's your name? He goes, exalted father. And so the caravan leader would say, oh, great. Well, how many do you have? How many children do you have? He goes, well, I don't have any. <laughs> you know, he, he sees it as he's a laughing stock. By the time Abraham gets to be 99 years of age, still no kid, God changes his name from exalted father, Avram, to Avraham, which is father of a multitude. And I can see Abram going, please, no, Lord, don't make me wear that name. But remember, Abram believed God. And there's no indication that he balked at that. So he took the name Father of a Multitude because he believed God. Okay, now here we have Sarah's faith in what we just read highlighted in Hebrews 11. When we read, however, the text back in Genesis, it seems to read a little bit differently. We don't, we're not like struck by her faith, right? Because in chapter 17 of Genesis, uh, she basically says, uh, Abe, look, I, I'm old, you're old. This ain't going to work. Um, I have a handmaid named Hagar. I think what God meant by that promise, we can't really like take the Bible literally. So I think what God really meant is that you can just go in and have relations with Hagar and they'll have a baby and that baby will be, let's call that the promise of God. Okay. It's a spiritualized promise. So there's not an indication of faith. Ishmael is born, and there's a lot of lessons that could be learned with Ishmael. We think we may know what's best and kind of order God to do it our way. We don't really know the full scoop, so don't ever do that. I love the story about uh, a girl who went to a computer dating service, and she knew exactly what she wanted in a suitor and a husband, and she was very specific on the computer. She wanted somebody who was short because she herself was a wee little lass. So I, she said, I want somebody who is short, somebody who prefers formal wear, and somebody who loves water sports. So the computer sent her a penguin. <laughs> short, formal attire, loves water sports, okay. Um, here's the point, even when we order up a penguin in life, an Ishmael, God is still faithful. So they go ahead and have a child named Ishmael. Mm -hmm. Chapter 18 of Genesis, God comes to Abraham again and says, Sarah's going to have a baby. And um, Abraham goes, oh, Lord, this is getting so old. Um, let Ishmael live before you. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Just fulfill your promise through him. You know, we went through this rigmarole to have him. He's here. Use him. And God says, nope. I'll bless Ishmael, I'll make him a great nation, but your wife Sarah is going to have a natural born child. Now, when Sarah heard that promise, because 
it says the Lord and these, these angels appeared in the tent and they're eating a meal and make this promise. It says that Sarah laughed within herself. So she just kind of went, <laughs> that's funny. Because ain't no way I'm having a baby. And then the Lord said, hey, uh, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And she goes, I didn't laugh. <laughs> the Lord said, yeah, you did. I heard it. I know it. So she laughed. That was not a laughter of faith. It was not a laughter of joy. It was a laughter of, I don't believe it. Yet it, it remarks here about her faith. Yet, before the year ended, she was pregnant, delivered a child, and named the child laughter. Isaac means laughter. And th she said, the Lord's made us laugh. And now this was, this second laughter, different than the first laughter, the laughter, first laughter was a laughter of unbelief. The second was just a laughter of sheer joy. God did it. God did it. And God turned a retirement home into a maternity ward. <laughs> and it's just so weird, all they could do is laugh with joy. Here's what I love. Hebrews 11 doesn't mention her unbelief, doesn't mention her laugh of mockery, mentions only her faith, which must have been right at the end as she grew in her pregnancy and delivered her child. So Hebrews 11 makes no mention of her initial doubt, only her eventual faith. Why? Well, there's a principle in 1 Corinthians 13. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Here is God not, not even acknowledging the bad part of her testimony and just includes the good part because he is the God of second chances. Now, through all of this, 25 years, Abraham was patient. Verse 12, notice it again. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, he's 100 years old, were born as many as the stars in the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is on the seashore. Reproductively, his body was dead. Physiologically, Sarah was barren. But Abraham is not thinking of human frailty, but of divine faithfulness. Circumstances, I've said this on many time, uh, occasions. I want, just want to resurface this. Circumstances don't make you, and they don't break you. They r reveal you. Yeah. When things get good or things get bad, the real you comes out. And, and, and I think we could all say about COVID-19 with all the restrictions and all the stay at home and some of us have lost jobs and our faith is on the line. It really reveals who we are, loving or not loving, filled with faith or filled with doubt really sweet or really grouchy, whatever it is, circumstances simply reveal who we are. And we have, during this time, had to come face to face, not just with our kids and our wives and husbands and pets and projects at home, but us. We have to face us every day. And hopefully God is using this to get us here, to be men and women of great patience, endurance, as God is working these things out in us. Okay, let me give you faith fact number four. He lived for permanence. Abraham lived for permanence. Verse 10 tells us, for he waited for a city or for the city which has foundations. Remember, he's wandering around in a tent. He's a pilgrim. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Go down to verse 14. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had oppor excuse me, opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham was a Bedouin. He wandered in tents while he was on the earth. And though he was promised land, and he was in that promised land, he was waiting for the ultimate promised land, a heavenly country, it is called in verse 16. And then in verse 10, heaven is compared to a city. I, I find this interesting. He waited for the city which has foundation. He came from a city of 300,000. He's wandering along the Euphrates River, out in the wilderness, out in the open. But he's, he's waiting, looking for the ultimate 
town, the ultimate city. So the Bible here is, uh, refers to heaven as a country, refers to heaven as a city. Most often, we're used to hearing heaven described as a kingdom. In the book of Daniel, the words of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we think of heaven as a kingdom. Here it's referred to as a city. Do you know in the book of Revelation, at least part of heaven, is a big city? Which isn't typically how we, how most people would imagine heaven. It's like a city. I don't want to go, you know, like right now in COVID, you don't want to be in New York City. You want to be in Colorado or New Mexico with wide open spaces, right? You want to be as socially distanced as you can. The idea of, of coming to a city with tons of people, it doesn't sound like heaven to us. You know, we think Maui, not New York, right? <laughs> um, but Revelation talks about the New Jerusalem, and, and that is a city that is 1,500 miles cubed. So 1,500 miles, the distance, 1,500 miles. If you went from Albuquerque to Spokane, Washington, that is 1,500 miles. Or from Maine to Florida, that's 1,500 miles. Um, so if you took that and, and, and made a cube, 1,500 miles cubed, that's how big the new Jerusalem is. It comes out of heaven toward the earth, not this earth, but a new heaven and a new earth. But part of our environment in the future will be a heavenly city called the new Jerusalem that we will enjoy. Why is the city important? A city is a place of fellowship and proximity. There'll be nothing that separates us in heaven. That's the idea, at least, of the motif of the city, I believe. Also, a city is secure. Keep in mind, 2,000 years ago, people weren't dreaming of, of ranches in Montana, Colorado, or New Mexico. They were dreaming of living in a city with walls because it protected them. Uh, it kept them safe from intruders. So the idea of a city for ancients was it was a place of fellowship, it was a place of security, and it was a place of, of wealth, of storage. You, you store things in cities. There's resources. There's amenities in cities. So um, we are, he was, looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Now, there, there's a fact check here. When the people around you who are unbelievers are telling you, uh, well, look, all there is is right now, right here, the earth. This is all there's going to be. This is all that you can expect, period. That's fake news. There's a whole nother real, really real world besides the real world that exists that we are awaiting, and that is the heavenly city, the heavenly country, the heavenly kingdom. And he lived for permanence. And then fifth and finally, the, the, the fifth faith fact. Boy, say that 10 times fast. Yes. The fifth faith fact for Abraham is that he lived in God's power. Abraham lived in God's power. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Now we're taken forward to Genesis chapter 22 in this verse. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham, when he was tested, Genesis 22, verse 1, opens up by saying, God tested Abraham. He said, go to Moriah, go to the land, I'm going to show you this mountain, and offer your son, Isaac, as an offering, as a burnt offering. The word test in Hebrew means to prove the quality of something by adversity or suffering. Wow. To prove the quality of something by adversity. And, and God tests people. God does not tempt people. Uh, sometimes the Bible uses the word tempt. That's like the old King Jimmy. Uh, modern translations will, will correct it. God tests. He never tempts people. Um, wow. The devil tempts, God tests. There's a big difference. Satan will tempt you to bring out the worst in you. God will test you to bring out the best in you. That's his intention. Now, for us, it's not easy to tell the difference. How can you tell the difference? Is this a test or a temptation? 
can I, can I give you some advice on that? If you're wondering, I'm going through this hardship, I don't know if it's a temptation or if it's a test, it doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't really matter because in that circumstance, I would say Satan is trying to trip you up, but God is trying to temper you. So God would even use the temptation as a test to make you stronger. So in the end, it doesn't matter. Uh, Joseph, when he was, um, you know what he went through. He said to his brothers, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Same circumstance. So you know what the test was. It was offering up his son. Um, God touched the most sensitive nerve that God could touch in Abraham's life. Kill Isaac? Well, why was that the most sensitive? Because for one simple reason, think of all that we studied so far. All of God's promises to Abraham were wrapped up in the existence and the continuation of Isaac. Wow. He waited 25 years for Isaac. Isaac represented his progeny of faith. Isaac represented the inheritance in the land of promise. Not only that, Isaac represented future salvation, messianic hope. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's a prophecy of the coming Messiah. So when God says, hey, Abe, take your son that is the son of promise and go kill him, he's faced with a dilemma. He's faced with an ethical and spiritual dilemma because the promise of God all the promises of God require that Isaac live. But the command of God requires that Isaac die. That's the dilemma. He, am I dealing with a self-contradicting deity here? Because he says, here's Isaac, the son of promise. I'm going to bless the world through Isaac. And now he says, go kill him. So notice what it says. In the text, we'll wrap this up. Verse 19, concluding, concluding that God was able, this is Abraham concluding, God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which he also received in a figurative sense. Now, here's what's noteworthy about the original story. We're not going to turn to it, but back in Genesis 22, when Abraham and Isaac and their servant come to the land of Moriah, Abraham takes Isaac and says to the servant, you stay here. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And listen to what he says. And we will return to you. Not I will return to you. Uh, we're going to go and worship and we will return to you. Wait a minute. God said, leave him on an altar dead. But Abraham says, we will return to you. Why is that? Well, probably the night before, he's not sleeping well. Wow. I'm thinking if you're going to kill your son the next day and you know it because God said it, you're not, you're not having a good night's sleep. It's very, very unnerving, unsettling. It's, it's that dilemma. It's that dilemma you go through. Sometime in the night, it clicked. I get it. I get it. So you see, you see the word concluding in verse 19? Greek word is logizomai. Logizomai is where we get our word logic. So uh, let me give you a, a bad translation because it's not even a word. He logicized it. He applied logic to the situation. And so he reasoned, came up with one of two conclusions. Either number one, God is erratic and can't be trusted. Or number two, God is faithful and sovereign and can be trusted. Which means that I'm going to go up there and plunge a knife into my son, and God's going to raise him from the dead in front of my eyes, and we're going to come back and see the servant that I said we'd come back to. We're going to go worship, and we will be back. Sometime in the night, he concluded that God is going to raise his son from the dead because God said, kill your son, but God said, your son must live for all the promises I gave you to be fulfilled. There's only one conclusion logically I can come up with. God is going to miraculously raise my son to life in front of my eyes. So we'll be back. <laughs> he lived in God's power.
power. What did he believe? Verse 19, that God was able. Hang on to those words, brother and sister. God is able. What are you dealing with? God is able. What are you fearful of? God is able. What are you struggling over? God is able. And another secret of Abraham, it said, stay here, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. Never forget to worship in the calamity like Job did, like Abraham did, like you and I must. Pause on the ash heap and worship God. Are you discouraged as you looking ahead? Are you unsatisfied because you wish businesses were at 50 or 75 or 100 percent and they're not and the economy is slow and you might face a very uncertain future, even a dire future? Uh, I'm certain I'm speaking to some who feel discouraged. God's plan cannot be thwarted and God has all power at his disposal to take care of you. Those are ideal words to launch us into 2021. Fact Check is our series and the life of Abraham our subject in this message by Skip Heisek. Now we want to offer you a copy of Skip's latest book. In Biography of God, he shares the intricacies of what the Bible reveals about God's character and His plans. Skip helps you recognize and remove the limits you may have placed on your idea of who God is. You'll gain a better understanding of the omnipotence, paradoxes, and mystery central to God's being. Order your copy of Biography of God online at connectwithskip.com for a donation of $35 or more. That's connectwithskip.com or by calling 1-800-922-1888. That's 1-800-922-1888. And get a copy of this interesting and helpful book. Call 1-800-922-1888. Thanks for joining us on Connect with Skip Heitzig. We're connecting you to God's never-changing truth in ever-changing times.